Hi, this is Chris Howard, host of Plugged In with Chris Howard, and I'm taking the Lions over the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Bet Online has free odds and lines available online or on your mobile device. Visit Bet Online today. McDonald's classic burgers are iconic, but even goats can be greater. So they took it to the kitchen, made the burgers hotter, juicier, tastier. Perfectly melted cheese. McDonald's best burgers ever are here. Ba da ba ba ba. Available at most restaurants in this area. Hello and welcome to the Media Roundtable Special Edition podcast, where we talk about everything that's been going on in the world of audio uh, in service of the chief audio officer. That is the person who represents a brand and who's trying to figure out how do I make this very peculiar channel successful. And so we try to talk about what's new in the world that will help them do that job better. It's a it's a narrow lane, but an important one. Um, and it, uh, it, it as as the chief audio officer goes, so goes uh, a very large industry that represents about twenty percent of a consumer's time. Uh, so so the implications here are wide. It's been a crazy year in twenty twenty three, and I know we've been saying what a crazy year every year, particularly since twenty twenty. But things seem to not slow down, even though it's been uh, what we might call post COVID. For the last 12 months, a lot has been happening. A lot has been changing. And some of the changes that happened in the years prior, we kind of started to see the boomerang effect of many of those changes. So we're taking a lot of time this month just to recap and to look at what were the big stories that happened over the year and and remembering what has occurred and how that's going to be important going into the future because the industry is very much at a crossroads on many fronts right now and the various tentacles whether it's just podcast which everybody likes to talk about or streaming which is actually a larger channel than podcast or terrestrial late radio which is still quite large itself there's a lot that's changing. And so we're going to unpack some of that for you today. And we will come back in January and we'll do a little bit of forecasting. But right now it's just about trying to make sense of the ways that the world is, has shifted in the last 12 months. I am your host, Dan Granger, CEO and founder of Oxford Road. I am sitting at, you can't see it in the shot if you're watching on YouTube, as most podcast listeners are. Uh, but I am sitting at the media roundtable in my office at our corporate global headquarters here in Sherman Oaks uh, in Los Angeles, California. And I'm joined by some of my favorite people to meet a round table with. Of course, we have uh, the great Stu Redwine, our head of creative at Oxford Road. Welcome, Stu. It's great to be here. We have the wonderful Spencer Siemenson, who is always uh, the most knowledgeable about the space, representing our media efforts at Oxford Road. Glad to have you with us, Spencer. Thanks so much for having me again. And then, of course, we have James Ingracia, who is our head of account services, and he's able to kind of round out all of the all of the different aspects from media measurement messaging all the different pieces james has to kind of deal with everything and so he's going to be um uh really giving us a boots on the ground perspective on a number of these topics so james i'm glad you're with us today i'm glad i could make it on a special after school edition of media roundtable why is it after school the after school specials those are always fun to to watch on tv you know, your favorite mm. primetime show was around at like three o'clock. It's a special edition. It is a special edition it, and, and special it is. So so let's get into it, guys. This was this was a year. A lot of things changed this year. And I think, you know, the big one, I don't know if I'm making this up or I heard it somewhere else, but I would say pod crash has kind of been the headline uh, for this year when we came into 2023. Um, one of the articles that I felt best encapsulated some of the things that we were dealing with is podcast companies once walking on air now feel the strain of gravity. And so, Spencer, I, I want you to speak to this first. What happened in 2023 where there was so much press around the challenges that the podcast industry has been facing? What happened? Just had more quantity than quality when it came to crashes you know um every industry seems to be going through their scandal era 
And it just became time for podcasting to feel the strain of that. We have some larger news that continually has been transposing through the whole year, but there were smaller ones as well. And each one of them seemed to have a different issue. Um, at the core, it's probably the investment strategies and the ways that they decided to pivot businesses with the the newly emerging podcasting that we saw. Um, Dumb Money did end, the brand came in and now is king. But for the most part, DR is still trying to find its stride once again. And we've seen this with multiple things. We've seen it with Spotify, obviously. We've seen it with the crash of cast. We saw it with the lawsuit over Tenderfoot, uh, the dissolution of the partnership between Odyssey and APM. And each has its own complexities. Sometimes it's host minimums that they can't come in and meet because advertising dollars aren't there. Sometimes it's going with hosts who have don't have a social following yet to build upon. Sometimes it was content that just didn't pay off in the long term. And sometimes it was them trying to make podcasting radio, which we continually have told them not to do. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to pick apart. I would love to hear what James has to say about it, yeah. honestly, because there's a lot of fertile soil there. I think you touched on something. And, and one of the things that, you know, there's been a few really big bets in talent over the last year, some pretty big names like Meghan Markle, even Michelle and Barack Obama, like got podcasts and they don't anymore because they didn't work. Now, I think that just goes to show that maybe someone thinking was if someone was popular in the news or was notorious for, um, you know, just being an, a headline attractor, doesn't mean if you put a microphone in front of them, it's going to just work and people are going to flock to that podcast, as I think we saw time and time again. So I do think that those have subsided. You don't see too many really big deals uh, going on anymore. However, I don't think that it's all necessarily bad. You have to be good at podcasting in order to have a good following, to have it last more than just two or three episodes. I mean, look at the Kelsey brothers. Even before this year's headlines they were in, they had a really good podcast last year that a few of our clients got involved in. Um, and even this year, just it's one of the podcasts I listen to. It's, they are actually great podcasters and they're not just sports celebrities. And so I think you have to have that passion that you're going to carve out hours a week as a podcast host to prep, record, edit, have guests on and actually make and, and care about your podcast. And if you do that, the followers will come and the listeners will come uh, versus people who are just being paid to podcast. You know, that's actually an interesting point too, because a lot of articles came out after or during the strike. And we saw a lot of people being like, you know, celebrities are going to come back into podcasting because they don't have the money from their projects anymore. And it's going to be just like COVID again. And all these people are going to come in. But I feel like for the most part, we really didn't see that as much as we did in like 2020, 2021, because I think that the networks through osmosis have learned that that's just not the way to do it. And that if somebody comes in short term and doesn't actually care about the content, it's not going to sell long term. So they don't even really try. I, I say this too, is like wiser with me, Julia Louis-Dreyfus just won like best podcast through Lemonada. But though there are those those examples here and there, we really didn't see that as much. And I think we won't, not to talk about 2024, but we might see it in 2024, but I don't think so. Well, one other thing that I think is going well in terms of just big bets is that the acquisitions are seem to be going well. So while I'm not the biggest fan of all the big networks getting gobbled up by the even bigger guys, um, I know like Spotify acquired two of the leading four pixel providers for attribution earlier this year, um, or maybe it was later the year before, but it was within recent 18 months. And they've since completely absorbed them into their system. And now they have their own pixel attribution program that they're offering at no charge to advertisers. So that's a competitive advantage on their end, which seemed to have paid off for them. Um, but you know, time will tell to see how pixels fare in this new world of podcasting in 2024 which we'll get into well, next month. <laughs> yeah. And it just kind of sort out this issue a little bit. I mean, a few things macro, the press always exaggerates, right? And so we saw a, an abundance of news articles coming out this year, basically saying 
Uh, the sky is falling for podcasts. The sky is falling for podcasts. Was it all just hype, right? The problem was, I think there were probably billions of dollars of earned media around hyping podcasts for the last five years, basically since Serial, so closer to 10. People have loved talking about podcasts, even though it's smaller than streaming. Streaming is a bigger business. More audio listeners have shifted from terrestrial radio to streaming audio then people have spent time with the podcast universe and that's reflected in the revenue where you've got effectively about an 18 billion dollar advertising pie in the US podcast is only seeing two of that streaming sees more and terrestrial sees more still but podcast gets all the attention and so when all of a sudden podcast starts stubbing its toe then everybody wants to pile on and say look how poorly the industry's performing but i think we're kind of a victim of the hype cycle that was promoting it and helping it propel itself forward. That also think fueled some of these lousy deals where everybody was overpaying for this asset and that. Now, I think some of the things that you guys are speaking to is really helpful because what we're talking about is really, which were the bets that, that like we we're, we're in a bit of a, a correction in the marketplace generally and how much of this is just affecting the industry like everybody else and how much of it um were just bad bets just dumb things that were happening um that 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 really didn't uh belong here to begin with so for example you talk about the tech that Spotify purchased well when they bought pod sites and chartable for you know whatever it was a hundred million dollars uh or something they're about did those deals were those good deals for spotify and if so would they be giving it away for free right now or did they learn a lesson that they don't want to have proprietary in-house third party you know what was third party measurement handled as an organization we know everybody is regretting their minimum guarantee deals with talent where they were signing contracts with unproven voices for tens of millions of dollars in the hopes that they might make a good show. And I think, you know, just to underscore what you were saying, Spencer, I think the way forward is probably a good one where if you came into this business as an opportunist late in the game, because you were famous for something and you said, I'm going to do a podcast and then I'm going to be Joe Rogan and everybody's going to give me a pile of gold. Um, what you're learning is it's not so easy and those contracts are going away. On the other hand, you know, Spotify spent, you know, whatever they projected at $200 million on the Joe Rogan show. That was a successful show before they bought it. And it may have brought a lot of people onto the platform that that 200 million may have been a better investment than the 20 million they spent on Meghan Markle. Right. It's relative. But I think the, the thing that people have learned this year on the publisher side is not to invest so heavily into unproven assets and to make sure that there's a business model that's going to sustain uh, all the way through the chain as advertisers are asked to pay the rates to offset the costs. That actually has to work itself out. And you just can't be so speculative when money uh, is more expensive than it was before and the capital markets are changing. So there's a lot that's come out of that. And I would say, generally speaking, yes, there's been a stubbing of the toe, specifically in podcasts, but in audio everywhere. But the good news is it's get, it's separating the wheat from the chaff. And a lot of the easy come, easy go folks are saying, OK, there's no free lunch here. We'll move on to the next thing. And uh, the people that are really serious about it and committed to going through the cycles, that's who we really need to begin with. And I don't think they're going away. So um, with that. Uh, we've seen some other changes, and and James, I'm going to ask you to speak yeah. to this, which is that um, brand marketers are now representing the majority of podcast spend. Why yes. is this important? What does this mean? It, you know, it means that rewind 10, 12 years ago when Serial came out, that was like MailChimp. You still remember it to this day. MailChimp, it's direct response, um, performance marketing at its finest of, of the host actually delivering and using a product and delivering their promo code and getting their listeners to go support the show by, by working with that brand. And while that's still very relevant in today's age, a lot of, uh, because like you said, the headlines are out there from our last topic. The podcast is very popular. It's shiny object syndrome. And a lot of these big brand marketers are now in the space, which is great. We welcome them all. And we're talking the big 
CPG companies, the big insurance companies, the big credit card companies, everyone's now on podcast. Great for the industry, rises all ships. However, there are some things to consider now, especially if you're a brand who's used to having a lot of control of where your ad goes. So one of those implications can be creative. Do you just take your TV creative, strip the audio and put it on a podcast? Probably not great. I would just do, I love your, your feedback on in a second here, but most importantly is brand safety. So you know what you're getting when you're buying a primetime sitcom on TV, or you know what you're getting when you're buying a website with a banner ad on it, or even a social media site, you can really have those parameters in there. But with podcasting, as we've learned a few times this year for our own clients, you never know what guest might appear on a podcast you're advertising, what might be in the news that day that they may cover that they don't normally cover on a normal episode. And all of a sudden now your brand may be in the middle of a brand safety controversy. So I think that's a really interesting topic we might want to dig into here. Um, and Stu, I'd love to learn your your thoughts on creative and brand safety and for big brand advertisers. Yeah. When I think of the creative piece, I mean, the magic of podcasts since the beginning has been the intimacy of it, right? And that extends to the advertisers with those host read ads. That's like what has made podcasts podcasts. But like every week I listen to the the latest advertisers, the top advertisers in podcasting, and you're hearing the breaks, they're getting longer. There are more ads in the breaks. And to your point, it's creatives getting ported over. What it sounds like is just radio creative or the streaming creative is just getting ported over into these more cluttered ad breaks. But at the same time, like audio is having such a, so much attention right now. And AI is, is sort of working against the very nature of the thing. But Dinsu did this uh, study earlier this year. There's been increasingly more studies that are coming out on uh, the efficacy of audio and just how powerful it is. Um, and in that study, they saw that 41% of audio ads during it generated correct brand recall uh, which is better than their norm. The average impact on choice metrics was a positive 10% compared to the 6% norm. And audio ads produce more attentive seconds than other medium. But when you're stacking that up in the uh, the intimacy that is inherent in podcasts, what I'm concerned about is something Paul Rizmandel over at Signal Hill Insights, he he pointed out in response to this very study is that a podcast ad, a host read podcast ad doesn't have to earn your attention, right? Especially when they weave it in seamlessly into the content, they've earned that audience, they have that connection, they've used the product, hopefully, and they connect it right into the advertisement, right? It's seamless, it's perfect, it's beautiful, it's what we want, it's what we all want. But as more brand um, advertisers are coming into the space and the ad, the ad breaks are getting more cluttered, what I'm hearing, like gravity is pulling it down to be produce spot after produce spot where now I have to change my tactic to go, well, shoot, if I'm going to be in this cluttered break, I've got to now gain their attention. I've got to break through. It's not going to be read by the host. And that that's the the degradation I see happening uh, it, when it comes to creative in podcasting. Yeah, we talked this, about this a lot, uh, and for years we've referred to it as the the gentrification of podcasts. Right? Is there's a lot of hype around it. Everybody heard the podcasts are cool, and they heard stories about all these great tech brands that are leading the future and all positive. Um, and there was so much good press around direct to consumer VC backed tech brands. This is kind of pre what many people call tech lash that was happening in concert with the rise of the podcast industry and that kind of virtuous hype cycle that it was attending to. But the challenge is, like really any kind of media channel, it usually starts with direct response advertisers who don't need all of the sophisticated tools to tell them what they're buying because they just want to know if the ads performed for them. And a lot of times that can be figured out without the the standardization of definitions like what's a download or what is a podcast um you know there's a lot of tools that they're in the middle of trying to develop and improve so that large brands know how to kind of fly by instrument within the channel but the performance marketers didn't need that they just needed to see that the codes added up to a good return on investment and then they'd keep buying it well what happens over time is the brand marketers end up 
pushing out a lot of the performance marketers and you start to get, and you can see this in, in a lot of, in TV, really, like if you have prestige content and it's easy for br big brands to engage with, you don't see as many direct response marketers in those channels. Uh, direct response marketers end up, you know, buying things that uh, they can't do frequency capping on or it's somewhat questionable programming and might be more controversial. Um, and so it's following the typical progression and there's something good, but there's also something bad. They're building out this boom town. It's getting a library. It's getting a fire brigade. It's not going to burn down as easily, right? We like that. And we like being able to go to Starbucks while we're there too and not having to grind our own coffee. But the downside, like you're saying, Stu, is that you lose some of that magic that brought you there and where people get carried away every you're always getting carried away. Everybody's always getting carried away one way or the other podcast is all great. Podcast is all a mess. Okay. Um, the, the, the invasion of these brand marketers is great because it does lift all boats in the, from the standpoint of view, you can build more infrastructure and make it easier to operate within the channel. But the downside is it depersonalizes. And when you try to make something that is personal too efficient, you lose something in that. And we know that. We know that because we're a service-based business. And let me tell you something. We could automate 99% of what we do. And if you didn't have a human being as a Sherpa uh, kind of walking you through the nuance and helping you trust via a human being that you know and, and have a relationship with, it's a lot harder to trust the tools because the tools have their own set of problems. And with that, I kind of want to transition to another topic, which is the chief audio officer. This is where, you know, look at Oxford Road. We um, we we do shows like this where we give you our take on the news and why it matters to you. But we want to be more than just people that sit on the sidelines and give commentary. We want to um, increasingly be a, a force that shapes the industry. We believe that we have a, a duty to help lead this industry and keep it sustainable. Um, and, and give it what it needs when it needs things. And we've done that with things like brand safety, but we did something new this year that I think had an impact on the industry and will have an increasing impact on the industry. And that is, we started making noise about the importance of having a specialized role for people who manage it, whether it's on the agency side or whether it's on the brand side, whether you're a small direct response brand or whether you're a large global brand, you need somebody that speaks audio because audio is its own unique language. It has shades of digital, shades of influencer, shades of traditional traditional media. It is all of them and it is none of them. And so if your job is to make your brand successful in a way that you can actually see, feel, measure, you're going to need some help and you're going to need a nuanced approach. Uh, what happens when a big brand comes into the channel is they don't have this knowledge and they think, well, I can just treat this the way I treat TV or the way that I treat social or digital. And they throw somebody at it who's ill-equipped, um, hasn't really had an education because where do you even get an education on this sort of thing? And they don't get the results that they could. And a lot of money is wasted and a lot of opportunity is lost. So what we did is we put out a white paper and we started holding some events this year around this concept that everybody needs a chief audio officer. It doesn't matter what their actual title is. They're not going to have the title chief audio officer, but you need to identify somebody that's responsible for the success of a channel. And we know from uh, from the business that that we operate that radical ownership is the way to success. Having somebody that is truly, they've got their neck on the line for something, it matters. And we started bringing these folks together to collaborate and go, okay, how are you dealing with, you know, pixel getting, how are you dealing with surveys and the diminishing use of promo codes? How are you guys dealing with the changes in the landscape and dealing with hosts and frequency capping and all these different, very nuanced, very audio specific issues that you have to face as a marketer, getting people together to be able to talk about that because the conferences aren't doing it. The upfronts aren't doing it the general marketing conferences, people aren't learning anything and there's not a lot of published literature. There's just a lot of sales collateral. And so we started trying to address that by having a consortium where brands can come together and not be pitched by us or anybody else, but just collaborate and exchange best practices. And I expect that 
this movement of shared knowledge and shared expertise and shared resources and relationships between people that are dedicated to this channel, the more of that we see, and we saw major milestones this year, the more sustainable the, the industry is going to be. Because right now, brands don't really have a, a, a direct line to publishers to tell them what they need and what's going well and what's not going well. And through these collaborations, we're able to help facilitate some of that conversation that I think is going to be good for the industry. And we're going to be able to, to continue to help shape it in that way. Um, anything else you guys want to share on the, the notion of the chief audio officer? I would like to add just one thing that um, I, as leading up our client service here at Oxford Road, I'm constantly in contact with all of our clients. I just sent out a quick end of year, just contact refresh form and ask some questions about podcasts people listen to newsletters they subscribe to etc and uh two um of our clients noted that cao events are events that they would never miss regularly so look at that we started something this year and people are looking forward to next year's event so i thought that was All very right, then. Uh, good to see it you know we we try we do a lot of experimentation at oxford road we throw a lot of stuff at the wall and we do different initiatives and this whole thesis around chief audio officer and bringing people together so they could learn from each other we didn't know if that was going to resonate we did our first meetup in in uh, new york in april and it was really just a proof of concept we had no idea what a vein this was tapping because people just don't have anywhere to go to get direction objectively on this. And, you know, we all have our biases. But when you bring a bunch of people together to just talk shop and not talk about what they want you to purchase, uh, amazing things can happen. So I'm glad to see that the market's validating that. I think we've felt that. And I'm I'm just glad, you know, the business benefits will be there, but I, I'm, I'm glad that it, this forum now exists for the sake of the industry. So, all right, let's keep moving. Um, Spencer, uh, a lot, a, a lot of people have noted as they're highlighting the struggles of audio um, that uh, there's a fraud problem, and that's a scary word to throw out there. And you know, I think uh, it's sort of like a, it's our version of electric uh, election fraud. It's like they talk about. Well, it's always there. There's always some degree of it. But at what point is it like? What level of concern are we actually at? And are we getting better or are we getting worse at this? Is this an increasing problem or a diminishing problem? Can you give us a little bit of lay of the land that we've seen in 2023? And this kind of jumps off the last point that there are so many nuances with the industry that sometimes it's honestly very difficult to build partnership because there is a, a low level of trust in certain instances. And you really do need to get in with them and make it a personal problem for both of you in order to address ongoing issues. Because I would say we are at a really good point in the industry right now when it comes to measurement, when it comes to attribution, and to making sure that what we're seeing on the end of the funnel matches the top of the funnel. Um, in, I mean, years past, we were talking about, you know, keeping baked in and fighting DI. Now we have an internal term called faked in to mention uh, the spots that are put in dynamically that run embedded supposedly for short term. So that, I mean, that is a, has been an ongoing conversation since I've started at Oxford Road, but now we're getting into more nuanced takes, things around frequency capping and making sure that the downloads that we're seeing in our reconciliation sheets are real and aren't being put in ads for games or, you know, another medium that we're not paying for, trying to keep publishers accountable for what they're selling versus what we're getting. And, you know, you can have the best ad in the world, but if only 12 people hear it, it's not really influencing the way that we would prefer it. I think partially some of the reasons that we're seeing issues are with networks folding or comeuppances in the news is partially because of this issue. We at Oxford Road are working diligently with Podscribe specifically to work through uh, the end of the campaigns, figuring out 
where the impressions ran geographically, with what listeners, how many listeners, et cetera. But once we're all on the same page and speaking the same lexicon, I think we'll continue to improve. I wouldn't well, say how, we're- How long do you think that's going to take? That is the question that, and you posed it to me. You did pose it to me. I don't think we're on red alert right now. I think we're getting better and better and we're going to continue getting better and better in 2024. I think we have to. Brands are coming in and that's just like a diligent part of their vetting. So it's going to be necessary. Well, yeah, I mean, the standardization and, you know, we had a nice talk uh, with Steve Goldstein a couple of weeks ago about, you know, what I mean, last week, actually, what what is a podcast? Where do we draw those lines? What's a download? We're still trying to sort these things out. Right. And it's um, does it ever get solved? I don't know. Um, you know, we have like I think we've had to deal with a lot of this with platforms uh, just in other types of media that we consume, right? Like, what can I, what's a default app? Can I get Amazon Prime on my Apple TV? And, can you know, do these systems even talk to each other, right? And everybody has slightly different interests, which make it hard to consolidate. And the fact that there really isn't an official group that leads the industry, I think has been challenging as well. The more engaged and vocal that the chief audio officers get, I think they're at the top of the pyramid. And when they decide the way that they want it, I think everybody's going to get in line. But I think it has to probably come from the demand side uh, rather than the publishers getting together and going, well, this is how we want you guys to take it. It's like, well, maybe if that's how they want it, but they, they're they the customer they need to pick. Um, I want to I want to step back a little bit, though, Spencer, and stay on this issue. But so 12 months ago when we were wrapping up 2022, what was fraud in those days? And what is fraud today? Like, what are the typical use cases? You don't have to call anybody out specifically, but like, how has the issue evolved when we're thinking about it? Um, a year ago, I would say it was it was pretty much what download is going to where, and is it actually the downloads that we're paying for it? Now, I think it's it's a more nuanced set of subjects that we have to start with from the outset. It's things like frequency capping. It's things like Rongio. It's things like uh, high concentration. And, and we have the tools to start working through that in the future. Um, but to your point, yes, it, it has to be CAO down because they're the ones who are going to say, hey, I'm not going to pay for this if it runs incorrectly in the future. We don't have the that authority right now. We need that for 2024. So, so fraud is evolving and, you know, without just being alarmist about it, it's like a lot of this, I think we can chalk up to growing pains in the industry and trying to take something analog and make it digital. It's not a straight, nobody flips a switch on this. This is not a simple thing. And it's going to take us potentially decades to iron some of the basics out. Hopefully we can make that happen a little bit sooner, but it's going to take time. Um, but clearly I, I think, you know, my, my perspective on the fraud issue is that it's less about worrying about like devious people trying to take advantage of you right now. And it's more about the fact that people don't know what they don't know about how inaccurately some of these campaigns are running according to what was ordered. And no, there isn't a straightforward way to get the intelligence to know where the gaps are so they can even know what to prioritize fixing. And then there need to be technical solutions to fix them. So we're still in a very murky stage and it's probably a lot murkier than so many of these brands that are coming into the space even appreciate. Um, so, so that's uh, thanks for, for catching us up on that one, Spencer. All right. So tell me if you've ever heard of any of these companies, indeed, Shopify, NetSuite, Headspace, Quip, Theragun, Postmates, you know, I'm not only the host of the Media Roundtable, but also CEO of a company called Oxford Road, and we are the world's leading independently owned and operated audio ad agency. And what that means is that we help great companies, many that you have probably heard of on some of the other podcasts that you listen to. We help them test and scale campaigns in audio channels with podcast being one of those leading channels. Some of the work that we do includes media planning and buying, as well as analytics, 
attribution and insights. And we also have a very special way that we deal with uh, creative and copy generation. We have our own proprietary process called Audiolytics that allows us to score ads for their persuasiveness. If you're looking to be involved in audio and you want a partner that can help work with you to make sure that you achieve unprecedented ROI and massive scale, you should get in touch with us at Oxford Road. And by the way, the only reason that we're able to do the work of the Media Roundtable is because we have a great team at Oxford Road that supports us and makes it possible. So, you know, what we're doing is not just a podcast, but we're really trying to help brands live out their values and balance that with their business objectives, which is an increasingly hard thing to do in this world of misinformation and malice that's infecting so much of our media. But at Oxford Road, we don't want to just broker this stuff. We want to impact the industry for good. We want to raise the bar on what gets created. And Oxford Road is helping make that possible through the Media Roundtable. So if you're somebody that's interested in working with an ad agency or a partner on this type of work for your advertising campaigns, go to OxfordRoad.com. It's easy to spell. And get in touch with us or at least just sign up for our free newsletter, The Influencer. That's OxfordRoad.com. Um, James, I want to switch uh, to you yeah. because we can't talk about 2023 without talking about YouTube. What <laughs> happened with YouTube this year and and how did that how is that impacting marketers in this business? Just like pod, we talk about podcasts becoming radio on stop sets and brand advertisers, I think YouTube is becoming podcasts or podcasts are becoming YouTube, whichever side of the coin you sit on on this is, is becoming really interesting. I mean, just last month or a few weeks ago, actually this month, <laughs> earlier this month, Cumulus Media and Signal Hill put out a report that showed that YouTube is number one for podcast discovery. Like that's incredible for podcast discovery. So I think what's happening is the definition of podcast is definitely evolving and growing. I mean, right over Thanksgiving, my brother-in-law was over for uh, the week and I asked him what his favorite podcast was. And he said, Jay Shetty. And I asked him what he listened on. And he said, YouTube. So to me, that's very different. My wife listens on YouTube. I listen on, on podcasts. So I think just the fact that a, a podcaster has a platform to talk to their audience and they put a camera up is the easiest way for them to grow their audience from not just someone listening on their mobile phone or their desktop, but also showing it on YouTube. The only thing that's a little bit different right now, which I think 2024 might hammer out a little bit, is what does that mean on YouTube? I've seen some podcasts that put up their album art or their cover art and put the audio just behind it. And so that counts as YouTube. And I've also seen some podcasters take a YouTube first approach, meaning that video is what the ultimate do. And they talk about like, oh, if you're listening to this, you may not see what we're holding up here in the studio. And so I think I wouldn't quite call them influencers yet, because I think influencers are different where they're getting paid and there's like affiliate links and all these other things happening. And an influencer will take a brand and weave them into one piece of content that they have as part of a bigger strategy that they have. YouTuber and influencer in terms of podcasting is just doing their show on podcast. They're almost rivaling TV. People now at night will probably sit on their phone or their iPad or, or tablet and watch influencers on YouTube versus watching TV that's right in front of them. So I think that's a really, really big opportunity for brands to take part in. Um, and we're coaching a lot of our clients to think about them Somewhat first, if you're more of a direct-to-consumer brand, you can showcase a product and how it works. I think it's uh, really opening up a new um, new chapter in podcasting. Stu, do you have anything to yeah, add think, in creative on in YouTube? Yeah, for sure. I think you bring up a great. I think you bring up a great point on the knowing the finished uh, channel that you're going to be in, not just taking stuff from one and applying it across. Like if you've got that simulcast component or if you've got the the YouTube component, you've got the visual component, then how can you work harder with the advertiser to demonstrate the product, to showcase stuff, to give them things that they can wear? A person is not fully persuaded until they consider something demonstrated. So it's such an incredible opportunity when you've got the visual component as well, but it goes, that's two ways is in you wouldn't want to just take that and then apply that to something that's going to be in just audio. If it's going to be in just audio, then we want to use tools 
they're going to work for the theater of the mind. But if you've got that visual component, they're not just putting up their show art, but you can actually see the people. How can you leverage that? Because now you're getting both the eyes and the ears engaged as the person is watching or listening to that podcast. Yeah. And anecdotally, there are a lot of nuances with simulcast, just like there is with podcasts. It's not, you know, this is YouTube and then there's the audio off to the side and that's how we're going to say podcast. And and I think that's the way we keep positioning it in the media um, of simulcast can be a lot of different things. It can be 90% video, 10% audio, it can be 70% audio, it can be 30% video. It could be the podcast video on their usual YouTube, but then the audio on an RSS. So it's actually different names for different entities. Um, it can be video first and then backwards. Um, and then some people are just taking the audio itself and putting it on YouTube just so they can get the downloads because other people are already doing that and they want to get the mon their money's worth or their downloads first. Another reason that we're talking through fraud for 2024. So yeah, there's a, and I've already had to deal with that significantly. I just had a show that was sold video one place, audio another, and they smushed it together. And now I'm dealing with exclusivity issues because two different competitors were on two different media types. So it's just really smart to be aware of like what the media is as a whole versus what its insertion type is when you're thinking about testing in the future. I think there's a bit of a history lesson here for publishers and then the implications are on the marketers. And so I want, I want to just talk about both because I, I think this is a, a juicy topic. The big thing is, it's like, okay, YouTube's exploded. How did that surpass iTunes, Spotify, Google, uh, Google's other podcast app and so forth? How did that become the place? But, but there it's, there's a pendulum that's kind of been swinging back and forth for, for the entirety of this uh, industry where it started out being an open platform that anybody could access any content. And then you started to see institutional publishers coming into the space going, we're going to distribute through the, the RSS feeds. Okay. Now you had kind of two different camps. You had the, the public radio camp that put out a lot of early shows, this American life and so forth where they said, we don't care where you consume it. We're going to distribute everywhere. It's going to be an open ecosystem. We're going to not try to gate this stuff. You had others come in like iHeart who said, oh, we're going to put out a show. We're going to make sure you can only listen to that show through the iHeart radio app. Now, what did they figure out? They figured out, oh, when you gate it, you don't get as many people participating. And we're all actually net positive if we open it up again. So... I would say for a good solid five years up until the pandemic, most everybody had agreed that these were going to be open ecosystems. We were going to distribute. If it were, if you could distribute your podcast, you wanted to do it. When Spotify bought out Rogan, you started seeing the gates come back up. And that's where you started seeing people pushing shows behind paywalls or at least behind walls of to control distribution so that they could drive up consumption of their platform. And that happened for a while. But now in a post pandemic economy, we're seeing that start to change because when you look at the deal Spotify is making, and I think they're the poster child right now for these deals, they're not necessarily exclusive to just the Spotify platform. Dax Shepard being distributed everywhere now, not just on Spotify, the deal with Trevor Noah being open now. So we're moving now again away from Gates. Now, why is YouTube such an interesting platform to be consuming a podcast on? One of the reasons is because YouTube is structured in a way that all of the other audio platforms are not. You can share a lot easier on YouTube. You can get other pieces of content that are like the one you're consuming recommended to you a lot easier. You can chop it up. And then automatically, when you finish a show, you're getting another sample of a different show offered to you. That doesn't happen through your Spotify or your uh, iTunes app. Yeah, they can traffic trailers but it is not the same search functionality and share functionality as you have through the YouTube platform. So I think a lot of it comes down to user interface and the shareability of it. 
and how much more promotion you can do. It's so much easier to promote a piece of content if you've ever tried to do it on a uh, on a on YouTube than it is on any of the audio apps. So I think that's a, a really important part of this conversation. And I think there's an opportunity for audio platforms that are exclusively audio to learn from YouTube about how to make promotion a little easier, how to make cut downs a little more accessible, how you can kind of cross pollinate different pieces of content and share and promote more easily. But the big implication for the marketers, because that's not really their problem. The big thing for the marketers is that now they have the challenge of every time they start to organize their teams to manage these user generated ecosystems, the rules change on them. So they used to have traditional media experts that bought traditional media and they might have a TV expert and a print expert. And then you had this thing called digital and digital kind of shook things up and you started getting digital specialists dealing with those channels. So then, then you have to deal with influencers, which are typically thought of as digital. But with audio, now the lines are getting so blurry that they don't necessarily have assignments on who is going to be their ambassador into these channels where there are an infinite number of creators that they could be partnering with. But they are, uh, but, so they, th there's too many choices on who they could sponsor. And if you're, if you have an influencer agency, they're not really necessarily going to be paying attention to a simulcast of a podcast that now has the majority of the consumption through video. And if you have somebody who's only an audio native, they may be missing out on a lot of the YouTube influencers that are native to that channel, not even to talk about TikTok or Instagram or any of the other platforms. So it's very, very confusing. So just to kind of distill all this and, and boil it down and we'll move on. But I would say if you're a marketer and you're trying to figure out how to navigate the complexity of that some podcasts are now on YouTube. And sometimes the consumption is greater on the video feed than the audio feed. I think it's important to be deliberate about who is representing those channels to you and make sure that you're not missing a big chunk of your potential addressable market by ha drawing the lane lines too far apart from each other. Because you need somebody that's dealing with the content that is audio first, even if it's big on pod, on YouTube, and you need somebody that's big on YouTube first, and you probably should let them talk to each other or, or make sure that you're getting a view on a lot of these channels. Because it's not like you can just open up your, you know, your yellow pages or your directory of syndication networks and paint by numbers. You can't do that anymore. This is chaos. And you need people with terrain knowledge who can surface to you the opportunities that might make sense, but that don't necessarily, we don't have clean labeling on yet. So it's very complicated. There's a lot of implications, but the note that I think is a takeaway for brands is make sure you have assignments in who is representing these channels for you that so that you're not missing large swaths of your potential audience. Okay. So let's, uh, I know we're running out of time. we got a couple big topics. Stu, why don't you just give us a little bit of a recap on this year in artificial intelligence. AI has been, you know, big for every industry. What do you think is important in audio? Yeah, it's another juicy one. I think the most important thing in audio is to take a position. I think uh, 2023 in the years prior, just the warm up um, on, on artificial intelligence uh, and the attack of the clones, as I like to talk about it with the cloning of human voices, just a, quick uh, tour of three stories from the year business insider in may uh you know they talked about bill simmons um the founder of the ringer and the technology that they're working on to be able to train ai with a host voice so that they can do targeted ads which sounds really cool i can make this ad customized to you custom to your geo and it's the host voice but is it uh do i need to disclose that uh yes um so how's that going to play out then in september there was a radio station, Live 95.5 in Oregon, that used AI Ashley as a DJ for an entire uh, shift. I, and I think that that's, uh, you know, once once that seal has been broken, you will see uh, more and more of that. You know, how personal can 
a AI DJ B, but sometimes when you think about it, I mean, how personal are some DJs? The the greatest ones are incredibly personal and there's a ton of intimacy, but sometimes it's it's just saying something kind of wacky and transitioning to the next bit, right? So why isn't that something that we can't have AI do and uh, how comfortable will people be with that? And then Ashley Carmen uh, reported in Bloomberg uh, in September, she referred to the Joe Rogan podcast from uh, earlier this year that was completely AI that was, you know, was not his voice. Um, and then Rogan had commented, this is going to get slippery. I think he's exactly right. And uh, Ashley had talked to, I'm going to butcher this name, but Alexia, Alexia Bidet is a partner at Claris Law. And they were talking about the legal challenges that might still arise around AI voices. And that's where I think the point that was made in that article is that there isn't really a position that has been taken by the industry on where do we stand on this? Do we disclose that it's an AI voice? Uh, when do we disclose that it's an AI voice? Is it something that is just happening and people don't know is happening? Um, that's something that I think the CAO club um, could tackle. But the the shift that I see coming with all this AI stuff, and I think it's going to be in audio, and I think it's going to be across all the commercial arts, is like two forces that are going to be at work. One of them is that all of this autom automation and efficiency that the AI stuff gives us. That's great. But I think you're going to see this kind of turning into a prediction for 2024 is a shift towards authenticity and intimacy and handcrafted bespoke. The fact that you know that this was an ad that was recorded with real musicians and this absolutely is a actual actor's voice. You're going to see a space is going to be created for that as a reaction to how much is going to be poured into the increasing use of clone voices uh, in audio. There's so much there and uh, agreeing with everything that you've shared, you know, there was a, there was a time when I remember first hearing somebody say that data was the new oil. And what I wonder is not to get too far into predictions, but I wonder if authenticity is going to be the new oil. Yes. As data and technology is so ubiquitous and accessible to everybody but no doubt i think we're only scratching the surface this year on what ai means to audio and you know audio has always been a decade behind everybody else so we may have a little more lead time than some other industries uh it looks like you want to get something in yeah here. yeah one last thing is i i think what i started with it so i think the important thing is you can sit back and you can wait and you can let it happen or you can get together with your team, with your CAO, and figure out where do I stand on this? Where do we stand on this? And take a position. Because then you'll be operating from a place of strength as opposed to sitting back and just kind of watching. And you might see where are there opportunities um, that can be taken advantage of. Because in general, it seems like the industry is just kind of laid back and letting it happen. How can we go ahead and take a position on when do we disclose? How do we use AI? How do we use voices? And these are the rules of the road that we've put together. Um, beautifully said and amen to that. And I think um, it, when we think about other implications, like the tools that it empowers, you know, kind of the final topic that I'll just riff on here for a minute here um, comes down to brand safety and suitability. We are wrapping up 2023 where I think we got to, I know everything's political and Things are still polarized and crazy, but I think we had a, a moment of respite where people were a little less into the food fight than they were before. From what we can tell in the middle of December in 2024 or 2023, it looks like we're going into a, a rematch of Trump versus Biden because everybody's excited about that. Um, it's going to get contentious again. It's going to be hard with every single issue becoming a political battle and it's hard for brands and we've had a couple of years now in the and safety and suitability space to try to catch up with that there's been a lot of tech that has attempted to deal with that my view is that we've been in the 1.0 phase of brand safety and suitability and it's all kind of been based on topics and keywords and kind of reverting back to the old way of block lists, or they used to call them blacklists, now they call them block lists, but whatever it is, saying this could lead to negative discussion, therefore we're not going to go near it. That's the old version. 
one thing that we were a part of this year that I'm really proud of, and I hope is symbolic of where the industry is shifting to, is the release of the civility score. Because it was the first real clear and focused attempt to get away from keywords and move toward context and look at the way that people are being treated through speech rather than just saying, oh, if you talk about this topic or that, it's an unsafe territory for a brand. Responsibility matters. We talk about it every week on this show. And the civility score that Seeker released in partnership with Oxford Road, I think, is the first step in trying to provide a viable solution that's going to be absolutely vital in as contentious a year as we're moving into with the, the next political cycle. So I think that was a big update. I think AI and tech plays a big part in that. And the better the tech gets, the better it will be at unearthing the nuance of a conversation so that people can make more informed decisions and not such sweeping judgments that are making it unsafe to talk about some of the most important issues in the world. So with that, I'm going to close and just say thank you guys. I think this is our last roundtable forum with our Oxford Road team this year. You guys have all been stars and uh, a lot of people have contributed this year, um, but I think it's been an amazing conversation. I think this makes us better contributors in the marketplace and I hope that people have learned a few things. I know that our, our listenership is actually growing pretty substantially. So I think people are getting stuff out of it. So I just want to thank my fellow agents of influence uh, for really bringing it this year. Um, and specifically those of you that are on today. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, James. Thank you, Stu. Um, and uh, 2024, we're going to get back on in January. We're going to have a, a team um looking ahead and saying, here's what you need to do. Uh, you know, here's what we need to do as an industry, uh, making some predictions about where things are going. This podcast is brought to you by Oxford Road, where we want you to succeed in audio and to use your influence for good. And as members of the marketing community, we believe we have the power to advance voices that don't just entertain, but edify and to rise above our differences and show that collaboration is possible when we treat each other with respect. We'd love to hear from you about what you want from us in 2024, what you want more of, what you want less of, how we can do our jobs better. Please don't hesitate to email us, info at mediaroundtable.com. And if you're a marketer looking to align with our vision, reach out to our ad agency, Oxford Road. We do this all day. Go to oxfordroad.com, subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Influencer, and special thanks to Bianca, Kyle, Haley, Scott, Mary Jane, Everett, the team at Podcast One, and as always, influence responsibly. McDonald's made the burger icon, the Big Mac, even more iconic. More Mac sauce, perfectly melted cheese, onions added at the grill. So good, your boy's already on the hunt. Rubble, rubble. Yup, it's Hamburglar good. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Available in most restaurants in this area.